Hello, everybody. My name is Alexei, and uh, I work in, as an agile coach uh, in a company called Scrum Track. And previously, I worked for a startup called Quick uh, that was uh, then acquired by Skype. And today, I'm going to tell you about how things worked at Quick and what happened when Skype bought us and how we resolved uh, the problems with, that we had with the Skype process. So, um, first let me ask you a few questions. How many of you worked in Scrum? Okay, great. Then probably I'm okay with this talk. So it doesn't hang on me. I mean, what? How does it work? Okay. Like this. Can you still hear me? Okay. Fine. So quick. Uh, quick was an, uh, a startup which built a mobile application that allowed to uh, stream video. So. The idea was that you can share your live moments by streaming video from your mobile phone to the mobile phones of your friends and family and to the web. And uh, Quick was a startup, meaning it, it was a relatively small team, about 50 developers at the end. So, you know, it's hard to talk about the process when you really don't have uh, some meaningful process, I mean. As it usually happens in startups, you just do the work, right? <laughs> so, we had uh, two locations. One was Redwood and another one was Moscow. Our product owner was in Redwood and the development team was in Moscow. Uh, a few times, a uh, no, uh, once every month or a month and a half, the product owner used to come to Moscow to, to meet the team, to discuss the strategy and so on. At other times, we had team leads that were keeping in touch with product owner using Skype. Uh, well, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep in touch using Skype when you have uh, 12 hours time difference, but, well, we came to work earlier sometime, <laughs> so it was okay. And um, what happened when product owner wanted a new feature? He spoke to team leads and we formed a work group. A work group is a group of people that works on that feature, right? Uh, questions like architecture design and uh, some you know, implementation details were decided by this work group. So um, sometimes product owner gave us only the high level vision and we could figure out the details on our own. This of course required uh, our engineers to understand the business, but in a startup this is usually the case, right? So that's actually all about the process and quick. <laughs> By the way, if you have any questions feel free to raise your hand and ask them as I go because I want this talk to be valuable for you, right? So, yeah. So how many people were there in the work group? How many? Uh, what, are, what are the size of the work group? Size of the work group. Uh, depends on the feature. It's two people to five or seven people. Not, not too big. Is it same as the feature team? Is it yeah, it's, team? it's a feature team, but uh, the thing is that uh, unlike in the feature team, one uh, developer could belong to several different work groups, so they intersect. Um, okay, so what are the advantages of this? Uh, the first advantage is obvious really short time to market. We were doing rapidly, right? So uh, small features took us one day, two days maybe. Big features took us a month, month and a half. Uh, we were first to release video calls between iPhone and Android, by the way. Uh, faster than Skype uh, and anybody else. So, we had almost no bureaucracy. 
any issues were resolved informally. We had a few mandatory rules related to operating with production environment, which is kind of understandable. You have several million users, you have to do something to make sure your uptime is fine. Um, we felt responsible for the product. Because of this time difference, we couldn't rely on our product owner to make all the decisions. So we had to make product decisions on our own. And it was okay. Uh, and we were very close to the user. Um, we had uh, support engineers uh, that received uh, feedback from our users and they sent us weekly a report uh, that contained the top issues that our users had. And we decided basically what to do with it, whether we need to fix it or not. And then in 2011, Skype came in and said, we want to buy you, right? And uh, I don't know, partly uh, they have chosen us uh, among several uh, startups that did the same thing, probably because uh, of the, um, I don't know, the same positioning, I think. So uh, Skype's concept was we're doing service for you to be closer to your family. So that was also that uh, we did, unlike Justin TV or uh, <coughs> Bamboozer and other similar services. Um, and we were excited uh, to become a part of a large business because Skype was uh, at the time about 900 developers and uh, it, it was estimated to be $2 billion uh, for, for the company, I mean, uh, company worth, I mean, never mind. So we were excited to become a part of a large business so we were waiting for the Skype to come in and to, you know, give us some secrets, how you do business and so on. Uh, but at first, uh, Skype didn't touch us in the sense they just told us, you, you do your business as usual and that's okay. But we want you to, to do some features for, for the Skype also. And they asked us to, do, to, to allow Skype to send video messages. Uh, so they acquired us in January and our forecast was that in March, we would be able to release video messaging in Skype. Guess what? <laughs> in March, we couldn't release anything. And the reason was, well, there were several reasons, but uh, to generalize, it was because Skype uh, had certain constraints that uh, all of the Skype products uh, could, uh, should follow these constraints. And uh, we wasn't able to do that under these constraints. So, uh, after we failed uh, to release that in March, Skype came in and said, well, okay, we have to fix your processes. Now, uh, we have this structure, we have these processes, and you, are, uh, you have to figure out how to work within our structure. So, what was the Skype process? We had this concept, yeah, a little disclaimer. Since I was an agile coach for the Moscow side, my, my view might be uh, not complete, so I, I will speak from the point, from this point, right? So, uh, the sky process. So, uh, we had this concept of release vehicle. A release vehicle is, uh, is something that can be released independently of other parts. Examples are configuration management, for example, or authorization, things like that. Um, part of the system that could be released independently that had a team associated with it, that had a product manager and a product engineer manager. These are two people that were responsible for the dependency management and for interacting with other release vehicles. Release vehicles had backlogs and they were doing scrum. The concept was that release vehicle is a service like, you know, service-oriented architecture. So, there is a team that provides value 
to the other teams by doing some meaningful uh, software in, inside them, right? And uh, providing through APIs or something like that. So, uh, for example, if you work in a, uh, for a Mac client and you need something from configuration team, you have to make sure your task is included into their backlog so they can do it. And uh, either product manager or product engineering manager have the power to come in and say, we want this feature, when will it be done? Uh, so, now, uh, imagine you, uh, you have many services. Uh, you, uh, we had about 50 of these. And they all are dependent on each other. So there will be certain problems, right? How do you manage that kind of organization? How do you know if there are problems or not? If everything is going fine? Uh, how do you forecast when you have something ready? How do you know what's going on with your organization? Uh, to answer these questions, we have the system of RV reports. Every product engineer manager had to fill in this report at the end of each sprint. So, uh, was the duration successful or not means uh, whether everything planned for the sprint was completed or not. Was the release successful? Release was uh, not successful, considered failed if more than 25% of the sprints were failed. Usually, each release included two or four sprints. So in that case, if you had, uh, for two sprints, if you had just one sprint failed, the whole release was considered failed. When does a sprint fail? Uh, when do you consider a sprint failed? When you have uh, tasks or features that were not completed, that you included into the sprint uh, backlog initially. So out of 10 tasks, if one is remaining, that still means that it is failed. Yeah. Uh, if you had uh, release failed, that you had to, uh, then you had to explain why it happened. So what were the root causes? You had to do a root cause analysis and report the results to the management. And we had regular RV review meetings. It's when uh, product engineering managers and executives uh, together in one room go through these reports and talk about it. So. What do you think of this? Okay. I can't hear, sir. Well, uh, I said that using these principles, that yeah. would pressurize the team. Because we are pressurize the team. Yeah. yeah, probably. So, the question is, if you are an executive in a company that has 1,000 developers, how do you get transparency? How do you know what's going on? Right? And from this point of view, I think these reports uh, probably look like, uh, I don't know, good solution maybe, I don't know. So the problem was that, uh, you know, in uh, 2012, in May, we started to work on a new product and we thought we could do it in several months, right? But the thing is that, uh, we initially planned to release it in September, but in September it so happened that we had zero features ready. <laughs> so, how did that happen? What was the problem? Okay, uh, imagine that you are on a front-end team and you need something from a back-end team. Uh, what do you do? You are in the iteration planning and you figure out that you need something from the, from the backend team. You go to these guys and say, we have a dependency, please do this for us, right? Uh, what do they tell you? They say, oh no, we have our old sprint running, we can't take this thing right now because in this case we would have to drop something else and our reports would be read. 
and we would have to explain to the management why we have screen, uh, scope drops in our screen. But we can take the same thing in the next iteration, which starts in a week. So there's a four week delay, right? And in six weeks, it's probably you will have something ready. Uh, now, you start to work on this thing and figure out there's an integration defect and you need another iteration. So the most simple thing would take 10 weeks in case you have a dependency. There were a lot of dependencies. So now, take a look at this diagram. What happens if you need to, to get something through the chain of four RVs? Cycle time increases dramatically. Right? So for our new product, we have six RVs, six RVs dedicated to this new product. So uh, there was two backends, a library in the middle, uh, and three frontends, iOS, Android, and web. And most of the features require at least three RVs to do something. There's a metric in Agile called cycle efficiency. What is cycle efficiency? It's basically, uh, it's a measure of uh, how much potential you have for process improvement in terms of shortening your cycle time. Uh, you have a value added time, which is the time when you actually do the work that adds value. And you have uh, wait time. Uh, cycle efficiency is the ratio of value added time to the total time. So in this case, it would be 30%. Uh, what uh, cycle efficiency is good? I would say for Scrum it's about 20%, right? Because normally you have two week duration, you probably have about five stories in this iteration, you release it at the end. So you work on a feature for two days of 10, so five, uh, two by 10, 20%, right? Um, now take a look at this picture. This is uh, our way to measure cycle efficiency for one of the features that we were working on. So what we did, we asked uh, our product engineering managers to name us a few features uh, that are typical. Typical means uh, it, it has an uh, average amount of dependencies on other teams. And uh, this graph shows how this feature has been worked on. Um, so, column, uh, rows are the teams and columns are months. As you can see, it can be, uh, it could have been done quickly if, if you do this more parallel, right? So, uh, why did that happen? Um, Sorry, I have something missing, maybe, I don't know. So, uh, the thing is that um, the process was meant to make teams work more efficiently. Why did, pro uh, why did Skype adopt this process uh, in the beginning? Because probably management thought that uh, some teams might be inefficient. Right? And to, to help them grow, we will make them use Scrum and we'll send Agile coaches to them to make them more efficient in terms of Scrum. But the reality is that that's a local optimization. And because of this local optimization, the whole chain uh, probably gets worse. Why does it happen? Because of the silos that we've heard about on, on the previous talk, right? So, uh, this is usually the case, by the way. When you optimize for local optimization, your cycle time increases. Questions? Uh, so, I, I was wondering whether this is a real problem. Because yeah. even if for one particular feature, for one particular RV, <coughs> it seems to be uh, delaying the RV by a lot of time. Yeah. But, but at, the, at the same time, simultaneously, a lot more work would be done by the different teams. So, is it really a problem? Is it really a problem that the work is delayed? No. So, so why 
why the world, why some one particular RV okay. is getting delayed? Yeah. Uh, there must be some other work that is parallelly going on because the teams are not sitting idle. So when they are not working on this particular RV, yeah, they're working on something else. So, 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 is this really a problem? Is my question. <coughs> That's a good question because, uh, in terms of efficiency, probably uh, the manager's view of this is that they're doing valuable things. They're working on something else at this time, but the reality is nothing is completed so far. So several months passed and nothing is completed. Is that a problem? So are we doing on the right thing? Uh, are we working on the right thing? My question to you. So if you have a lot of things in process and nothing is completed, how do you make sure you're doing the right stuff? Maybe most of the code that you have uh, written so far is uh, it's not valuable, right? So maybe it's not what users need, maybe it's not going to work when you try to put it together. So that's uh, uh, inventory waste, no? work in progress. So uh, what Agile tries to do is Agile tries to make cycle time shorter uh, for you to get feedback faster. But when you work on many things, simultaneously and you don't finish any of them. You don't get that feedback. So I have a question. Uh, why could like, if you have like, multiple RVs, so why would the team I can't hear you. If you have multiple RVs, right? Like, like why would the <coughs> not based on the RV? I mean if you have So why don't they work on, on the feature together? Yes, that's right. Your, your original approach. Uh, the thing is that um, that's what we did at the end, right? So uh, the problem is that you have these reports. And uh, the problem is there are dependencies. And you, when you start working on, on this thing, something changes. But if you have these reports, uh, you have to stick to the, to the scope that you planned for in the beginning of your sprint. And you can't just drop things out because other team has dependencies on you. But yeah, that's the idea. So um, let me uh, let me continue to what we have done uh, to overcome this, right? So we held a series of meetings with uh, product engineering managers, and we agreed that um, regardless of the process that we have in Skype we want to create value in the first place and sticking to the rules is not the priority and uh, then we started we agreed to track our work in progress by putting together a product board this is our first uh, version of, of our product board we had uh, 23 user stories on it uh, 23 is is a lot and uh, probably, who knows what Little's law is? One person, two, two, three, three. Okay, a Little's law is about uh, is a relationship bet between lead time, work in progress, and average completion rate. Suppose you have a queue, right? And you have a certain amount of people in the queue. So how long will one person have to wait. You divide uh, a number of amount of people in the queue by the completion rate and you get this delay. Uh, the same thing is, is applied uh, to averages when you have uh, not a P4 queue but any kind of queue. Right? It says that uh, regardless of the type of the queues, your cycle time, your average cycle time is your average amount of things in process divided by the average completion rate. What does it mean to us? 
It means that we probably want to uh, make, make work in progress less, uh, to, to focus on less things, but uh, to, to focus on completing this stuff. So, how to do that when you have six teams which have ind uh, in independent plans? You can't just throw away some work and, and say, okay, we're not going to do this, we want to focus on this. Because in that case, your developers will sit around doing nothing, right? You don't want this situation. Uh, what we agreed to do, we agreed to take the most important things and to make them high priority. It means uh, when you have uh, to choose whether I should work on this thing from the most important list and something else, you always choose the chosen features, right? So we made a second version of our product board and we put eight the most important user stories on it. Uh, the agreement was that uh, if we discover any dependency uh, on any of these eight user stories, then your team have to drop anything that it does currently in the current screen and jump to resolving that dependency. That was the rule. Uh, by the way, by that time, we learned how to hide score drops from the reports. So we were safe in that sense. Uh, shortly after that, we discovered uh, several things about uh, our process. Uh, first one, uh, guess what? We could have uh, figured that by just looking at this diagram, right? But the thing was that there was a bottleneck. Library team uh, was in the middle of the process, so most of the features were dependent on their speed. So what do you do with bottlenecks? Uh, theory of constraints says we should identify it, subordinate, uh, remove some work that can be removed, and then make it wider, right? So what we did, we gone through the library team backlog, and we found a few things that could be handed off to another team. So we did it. So another thing that we discovered was that uh, there was a lot of rework between Android and library team. The reason was that library team consisted of engineers that were previously iOS developers. So iOS didn't have problems with that. But Android team did have this problem. So uh, when I say reward, I mean there were features that were handed off many times, there and back again. Uh, and uh, code was rewritten several times. So to fix that problem, we created an integration team. We took a few people from both teams and make them sit together and have a uh, unified backlog for them. And uh, another thing that we discovered was uh, that we had uh, scope increasing continuously in these eight features. So what we decided to do, we decided to fix the release date and not take in any more scope. Uh, so it was, I think, March 2013 and we decided that in May we want to release something even if it's not ideal, even, even if it uh, worked slower than we wanted it to work. Uh, but we decided that on a certain date we will release it to internal uh, dog fooding release to get feedback. So getting feedback was more important for us than uh, doing it ideally from the beginning. So that's what we did. And actually after this uh, May release we were able to release at monthly cadence regularly. Uh, it was a good thing because the de delivery problem was actually resolved by the time. Uh, I should tell you that the product itself pivoted several times after that. But at least we could deliver uh, on a regular cadence. And uh, we could finally prove to the management 
that we are not just wasting their money. I mean, uh, we could show them a working product. Uh, that's basically it. So to summarize a little bit, in Skype process local efficiency actually uh, Skype process was optimizing local efficiency what that was increasing cycle time dramatically and uh, what we did we visualized feature delivery and that helped us to control work in progress and we were able to reduce rework by creating integration teams and uh, after we fixed the date we were finally able to get the desired feedback. So that's it basically. Questions? Yeah. Typically, uh, uh, in, in teams we talk about uh, generalizing specialists. Uh, <coughs> some books, some some others look at this integration team as something tangible. Uh, how did how did it work? Yeah. So actually, you know, in the beginning, we as your coaches tried to uh, speak to the executive team about adopting Kanban. And we were told that the word Canva is prohibited in this organization. Uh, probably the reason was that management thought that if we decided to do Scrum, we should stick to that, right? The thing is that uh, if you um, just follow some rule, it's regardless of what this rule is. Scrum is also a set of rules, right? If, if, you, if you just follow the rules and you don't think what it means to the value creation, right? You are in trouble. Uh, so we were told not to create any feature teams or integration teams or anything like that. Uh, the thing is that we had to cheat the rules actually to do that. But is, is this a, a good thing or, or bad? I, I don't know. We saw it as, as the only way to to deliver a win, right? Executives didn't know about it. <laughs> yes? But typically, yeah. Scrum mandates like you should have cost in the right? Yeah. So I was really surprised like when uh, type, right? I mean, the management told like you have to have a so can, can you please uh, go a little louder? So why, why did they have uh, sprints not synchronized? Yeah. You cannot synchronize 50 teams. They have to be... Uh, so so there, there were too many of, of these teams. So you could have uh, synchronized their sprints, but... Uh, so what you can do in this situation, you can say that uh, all the company works in the same cadence, right? But, I don't know, what would be the value of it? Uh, so, I mean, as, an agile, as an agile, agile coach, right? I mean, typically, like, what do you uh, prefer? Like, I mean, let's say if you're going to set up a team and you have a review, like, if you know, like, for sure, like, okay, I need to develop these two features. So, the best way would be, like, to structure the team, which would be cost I mean, in order to deliver particular features. So, I'm sorry. I, as a thumb rule, I mean, when you when you talk about like Scrum, yeah, the thumb rule says that you, your team should be cross functional, at least from delivering a feature. <laughs> yes. The theory says that. I mean, so since you are agile coach, I mean, what is your uh, recommendation? I mean, when you see like okay, we need to do this. Uh, for example, we need to. Uh, deliver this feature. Uh, so the, what is the best practice then in that case? So uh, 
I'm sorry, I don't get this. I don't get this. Can anybody no, else? No, let, me, let me paraphrase. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, but you're saying as, as Scrum kind of mandates, we want to form cross-functional teams. Right. Okay. So why not take you know all the teams that are out there? Yeah, and, and create a cross-functional team. That's a good question. And we considered this opportunity. The, the problem is when you have a technology stack uh, to, with too many things, too many specialists in it, uh, by putting them in one team, you get uh, a lot of other problems. Like the stand-up won't be meaningful. They will have bottlenecks inside their team. You won't be able to balance the load, right? So there will be different problems. So, actually, integration team is a kind of um, uh, middle solution, right? So it's not a Fisher team on one side and it's not a company team. It includes specialists from several company teams. But it's not complete end-to-end, -end, right? Uh, so, in, in that sense, integration team is the best we could do. So if you try to put specialists from all the company teams together, that team just wouldn't be able to execute. Yeah. When a particular work uh, assigned for the particular uh, sprint is not complete, you you brand that sprint as failed. Yes. yes right? Now, yeah. uh, would that give rise to the tendency of getting less work to be to be done in the scrum? Uh, in the in the sprint, you <coughs> say that happen. Um, that's that's a good question. Actually, this is how we uh, hide uh, scope drops. Right? So <laughs> we just take less than uh, we can do, and include dependencies later. But the thing is that um, management position was that you should not do that. I mean, you should plan in advance what you're going to do. The, the, uh, the reason uh, management wanted us to, to plan for two weeks in advance was that they wanted forecastability. They wanted to, uh, to understand when something is going to be done. And when you uh, do things like, uh, like that, you just don't get that foresight, right? So, so plan less, plan for less then. Yeah. The, the, that's what the teams would do, given to them. They would plan for less amount of work than what they could do then. Uh, right? Some teams actually did that. Okay. And uh, our advice to, to these teams as agile coaches was that, was that uh, guys, you have to uh, have two kinds of velocity. The one is optimistic and one is pessimistic, and you have to include uh, the amount of tasks to cover pessimistic case. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, could you share a bit more on the controlling work in progress part, especially uh, there are different workflows, right? When you're talking about limiting work in progress or controlling work in progress. Yeah. So this was what we discovered that was actually going on. So we put this board together by simply putting on the wall all the work that was in progress. The thing is that uh, when you have this network of RVs, you don't have a direct uh, mechanism for controlling one progress, right? So what you can do is you can uh, prioritize uh, the features at, at the feature level, I mean. And uh, 
even if you don't do anything else, just uh, giving each feature a priority, first, second, and so on, you already uh, tend to decrease your work in progress. Because what happens if uh, some team is blocked by another team? What is the usual behavior? The usual behavior is taking in another thing, right? But if you focus on finishing something, they start thinking differently. They start thinking, what can I do to unblock this? And uh, whose help do I need to unblock this? The, the thing is that by just visualizing work in progress, you already make this problem less. Okay? Does this answer your question? Okay. Final observation to your question. Yeah. Did I hear you say that there were 50 different RVs? Yeah, 50 RVs, uh, the whole company. Right. So the question is, what does training mean so far? You must have had either a ton of them between different groups. Yeah. Or 50 people in a room all talking? I can't uh, We. Uh, the thing is that, uh, in the beginning, all these RVs operated uh, independently, and the planning was ad hoc. I mean, product managers had to make sure that the product they are responsible for is okay in terms of dependencies, and this is was based on personal relationships. Uh, later, we had another guy. His name was Chris Metz. You probably could have heard about him. Uh, he was working on uh, creating a process for product planning. Uh, he ran uh, two or three days workshops when a lot of product managers were uh, gathering in one room, 50 of them, and they had their plans for the next quarter on the wall. Okay. Yeah. In your example that you mentioned, the QLIP team and the Android teams, yeah. you said that the QLIP and the Android team had some problems. Yes. Now my question is, how do you spot that? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. But do you right. feel that's a challenge? Is, is it as easy as people raising their hands up and saying they have a problem? Yeah. Uh, you count the number of okay. uh, slips so how do you on, on this board, we had uh, stickers of different colors. And each color belongs to one team. So it visualizes what work does uh, any, uh, all the team have to do to complete a feature. Right? And we had uh, stand-ups near this board twice a week. So during the stand-ups, these things just came up. So why do we do this again? Right? So the problem is that when you have separate teams that have their own plans, they uh, have no uh, communication that can uncover these kind of problems. When you uh, make a board like this and ask them to communicate around this board, these problems come up. So we didn't use any special tools for that, it just came up. Okay. So, any? so sorry, there was one more question. Yeah. Uh, now that you said that this all happened uh, near the board, right. for companies, for IT companies who are spread a little bit geographically, they are yeah. distributed in nature. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a mechanism that you recommend, suggest this might be a way to spot that? And not only once, but consistently throughout the process. Yeah. Um, you know, in our case, we were located on one side, right? Um, now that I work with different companies, I ask this question again and again, and there are tools for visualizing these things across many sites. Uh, I can name a few target process if you uh, tune it correctly, uh, link it, and uh, now there is a startup in Russia that also creates some great visualization tools, but, but it's, uh, it's in alpha testing right now, so it's called Kaiten.io, but uh, I, I bet it's not open for public yet. So there are tools, right? The, the idea is that you should make things visible, right? Uh, to visualize the 
product delivery, feature delivery. And if you do that, things come up. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Going back to your last slide. Uh, Which one? Last slide, summary slide. The very last? Yes. This one? The last. Summary. 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 Thank you. 